trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. This morning, uh, as we prepare for prayer, I pray that um, some heart will be lifted up towards this morning. Uh, some broken heart. Uh, someone who is grieving. We remember the Light family who lost their beloved son and friend, nephew, family member. Remember the Spriggs who just lost the mother. We pray that God will continue to hold them in the hollow of his hand as he comforts them. Let us continue to remember Sister Frazier and Dion. Ask God for healing. Ask God for strength. Ella Minifield also lost her aunt not too long. Let us continue to keep her in our prayers. Even as you, you prepare your hearts, if you feel so impressed this morning, I would like you to come up to the altar and leave your burdens there. Whatever your difficulty is, whatever your lot in life may be, I ask that you bring it to Jesus this morning. And if you have it under control and you desire to remain in your seat this morning, I pray that you will fall prostrate on your knees or just bow your head in humble submission to him this morning as we pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, to you we come this morning. We come asking for a blessing this morning. We come with expectation that you are already in this place. We come this morning freeing ourselves of our human nature. And Lord, we ask the God that you will remove self from us and that you will fill us with an unction of your Holy Spirit this morning. We ask the God that you will hear our prayers. I pray the God that the families names that I've called, I've mentioned this morning, that you will go close to them, Lord, and that you will comfort them. Lord, it's so easy as human beings to rally around grieving families for a week or so, and then back on our own journey, because this life is so hectic and busy that Sometimes we forget to even stop and give a call or encourage a member along the way. Lord, we ask the God that your spirit will not be like us, but your spirit will continue to comfort and your spirit will continue to strive with us. I ask the God that you will be with Pastor uh, Washington at this time even as he's away from his flock I pray that God that your love and your mercy will be with him wherever he is Lord I pray that God that whatever message he has for your people Lord that you will mingle some salt and some seasoning and that you will let it be tasty and let the people that are hearing absorb it and put it into practice. I thank you for 
the elders who carry out your work, Lord. I pray to God that you will continue to bless their families. Yea, even the deacons and deaconesses who maintain the upkeep of your church, we remember them, Lord. The members, Lord, who are many, and so they have different problems, different challenges. I bring them to you this morning. I pray to God that as they have come to receive a blessing this morning, that you will not disappoint them, but that they will receive a blessing from one side, that you will touch your man's servant this morning, and that you will make him a vessel for you this morning that you will use him so that he can bring forth a message of comfort, a message of, of hope a message that will get your people moving once more and Lord when time on this earth will have ended I pray that God that everyone here under the sound of my voice would have had a strong connection with you and they would make heaven their home. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. That someone this morning will give their lives over to you. That someone this morning will be saved. Lord, take me. Mold me. Make me as a porter's clay. Ready to be used. Ready to be shaped into whatever you want me to be. Hide me behind the shadow of your cross. May Jesus be seen. May Jesus be heard this morning. May I be removed from this platform. And when all is said and done, 
May your name be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. If I was to title my um, message this morning, it would be the right connection. The right connection. Let us take our Bibles to the book of John chapter 15. And our scripture reading is going to be from verse 1 to 5. John 15 verses 1 to 5. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he takes away. And every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it. That it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Verse 5 says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abide in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, he can do nothing. In Bible imagery, Israel had been likened unto a vine. A golden vine had been placed at the entrance of Herod's temple. The figures of leaves and clusters of grapes would display on coins and architectural drawings. All over, the Jews, depending upon their connection with the vine of Israel, for their salvation. But Israel had proved unfaithful to its spiritual advantages and had rejected its true king, Jesus. Now Jesus presented himself the very last few hours before he was crucified as that genuine vine. The only true connection with him. The only true connection was Jesus. The only connection by which men could be saved was Jesus. And so just before the night before his crucifixion, Jesus gave that parable to his disciples. I am the true vine. And ye are the branches. Ladies and gentlemen, in growing up I was privileged to have parents that were farmers. More so I was privileged to be born on an island that is characterized as the nature island of the Caribbean. And so, as a child, there were many seasons. No, I'm not talking about winter and summer. We had many fruitful seasons. It was mango season at one point. And then it was watermelon season. And then it was grapefruit season. L.L. Uh, Hicks. And there were many seasons around on that lovely island of Dominica. And so we as kids, we were privileged 
to know what it is to, 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 to have a well-ripened mango. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh. And when you, 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 we would put our teeth on that mango, I mean, the, 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 mm. the juice would run down the side of our, our faces and, yeah. and, and it was... It was a delight. It was a delight. It was an awesome experience as kids. And, and when that mango season was over, somehow another season would start. It would either be orange or tangerine, and the seasons would roll on and on. And so there was not a shortage of experiencing good yeah. Caribbean fruit. Mm -hmm. I say that to say not every tree or not every mango tree produced mango. Unfortunately. And as 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 kids I, I we, we, we soon realize that this mango have not been bearing for the past two years. So I'm going to ignore that mango tree and I'm going to go to farm a brown mango tree because this one is bearing a lot. And so we as kids, we knew where to go for mangoes. We knew where, what patch of uh, uh, melon um, what, what field to go for melon? Where to go to get our oranges? And even the ones that produce fruits, they produce in different quantities. The branches did not all produce fruits. Some branches produce a lot while on the other side of that same tree, some branches did not produce at all. And so, while the same tree was a productive tree, the branches did not all produce in, abund in abundance. And so, Jesus is here saying that we are branches connected to the vine and we should produce fruits. Now, allow me to, to, to tell you that um, sometimes we would, um, we would see the, the, the trees, the branches, and they were so heavy laden that the trees would bow under the sheer weight of the mangoes, of the fruits. And some of, of the branches would be anchored in, 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 in to the tree, and, and therefore there was no breakage. However, some branches would break under the sheer weight of the fruit that they were carrying. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning I'm saying that we need to stay connected to the true vine. Stay connected even though you have been laden down by the sheer weight of this life. You need to remain connected to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. In John 15, verse 2, it says that every branch in me that, is, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruits. 
He who professes to be in Christ is expected to bring forth fruits appropriate to his profession. In Galatians 5.22 and Ephesians 5.9, these fruits are termed fruits of the Spirit or fruits of righteousness. That is, fruits which are righteous. This fruit should be evident in our lives and character. When these good fruits, as James 3.17 puts it, is absent, then it becomes necessary to sever the fruitless branch. And so, I remember as um, a boy that my father would go to, to, to his farm and sometimes we would see him take um, an axe and cut down the branches and we would, we would wonder why is he cutting down the branches but as I read this um, scripture I'm now realizing that these branches were fruitless branches and sometimes we need to cut now, wait a minute. I said we need to cut. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That responsibility is not ours. We are just branches. This is done by the husbandman. The severing is done by the husbandman who is God the Father. Too many of us are too quick to cut people off when we see that no fruits are being bore. Too many of us are quick to criticize and quick to condemn. Too many of us need to be cut off instead of other people. And so this morning... The Bible did not give us the responsibility to cut. Because remember, we are just branches. I never saw a branch cut another branch. I said I only saw my father, who was the farmer, representing the husbandman. It was only he who did the cutting. And so as Christians, we, we need to, to be a little patient with people. Galatians 5.22 gives the fruits of the Spirit, and patient is one of those fruits. And so as Christians, we need to be a little more patient with, with the people around us, with, with the, the, the brethren around us, with our church family. Some of us are just dormant. We are still in our dormant stage and just need a touch from the farmer. We just need him to remove the clutter around us so that we can begin to grow and begin to achieve what God has purposed in our lives. Some of us have so much junk that we need the husbandman to clear the bushes that hold us back. In verse 2, the word purge is to clean, to cleanse. In this case, the process of removing excess growth. Some of us are choked by selfishness, hatred, envy, jealousy, and as a result, we are unable to grow. If you look at um, a, a, a patch of, of, of melon, you will notice that there are excess growth around certain areas. And as a good farmer knows, he needs to, to, to go in there with his machete he needs to go in there with his snippers 
and cut out the excess bushes that is growing around the new um, the new uh, the new uh, vines, giving them space to breathe, giving them space to grow, giving them space to expand. Some of us are just consumed by what is going on around us in the world. We are consumed with Facebook, television, Twitter. Some of us are consumed with our lovely homes and cars, our careers. While these things are not bad in themselves, but spending too much time with them is not good. And so the farmer prunes the character. And as he prunes, our character becomes purged by the tests and trials of life. The father, the heavenly husbandman, oversees the process. And though the chastening, though the pruning and the cutting and the clearing may seem to be grievous, nevertheless, afterwards, it will yield, it will yield peaceable fruit of righteousness. There can be no life without growth. As long as there is life, there is need of continual development. Character development is a work of a lifetime. Sometimes we think things are not going our way. Sometimes we, we think that God is just not on our side because we did not get that big house that we wanted or we did not get that nice job that we were applying for. Maybe the car, maybe that promotion we've been slaving after. But Galatians 5, 22 and 23 might be at work here. Maybe God is just trying to teach us meekness. Maybe he's just trying to give us a little more patience. Maybe he's trying to teach us to be a little more gentle. Because with the promotion we might get over ourselves. And so he's just trying to, to make us a little more loving. Maybe when he gives you that person in your life that is unbearable that person that never ceases to stop talking or interfere in your business sometimes he's just trying to make you a little more lovable sometimes when he does not add that extra pound of meat on your plate maybe he's just trying to to let you be a little more temperate. Maybe he's trying to, to keep you on that diet that you've been struggling with. And so sometimes God will do things in amazing ways just to keep us in line. Sometimes God won't give us all that we ask for. Because he's trying to, to keep us in check and in line. And in verse 5 he says, Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. These are among the last words Jesus spoke to his disciples. He said this the night before he was crucified. He was giving them some of their final instructions before he completed his ministry on earth. He knew how important it was 
that the disciples did not split into 11 churches with 11 ideas about salvation. He knew how important it was that the disciples continue to receive their strength and authority from him and only him. In his illustration, Jesus is using a common agricultural picture that his hearers readily understood. They knew that branches of a grapevine or any other type of vine could not survive on their own. Branches must be connected to the vine to receive nutrients. Yes, I am the vine. The new uh, living translation says, those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Why did Jesus say branches and not branch? Branches and not branch because branches play a vital role in the productivity of a vine. And you might say, what does the branch contribute to the vine? Well, I'll tell you a little thing about branches and, and vines. Plants absorb nutrients and water through their roots by photosynthesis, the process by which plants create their fuel. This can only occur in the leaves. Photosynthesis is the process of converting light energy to chemical energy and storing it in the bonds of sugar. Photosynthesis takes place primarily in plant leaves and little to none occur in the stems. This means that our strength as believers in Christ is not solely dependent on the vine. Let me say that again. This means that our strength as believers in Christ is not solely dependent on the vine. We also draw strength from other branches, meaning other believers. For us to strive, for us to move on, we cannot be an island by ourselves. Most of us think that it is well with my soul and all is well. Well, I'm telling you, it is not well when it is well only with your soul. It should be well. Only when it is well with everybody's soul. Too many of us think of me and my. Too many of us think that the church revolves only around ourselves and heaven is only for us. Well, I'm telling you, we need each other. I need you and you need me. Sometimes I may sleep and I may fall. Now I'll tell you, if you are in the gutter already, you cannot help me. So I need you to be up on that pinnacle when I slip and slide so that you can help me up. We need each other and we need to encourage each other. Now where do the unfruitful branch go? Better yet, where do we go if we are fruitful? Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it says, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, 
it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The Living Translation says, God saved, saved you by his special favor when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Verse 9. Remain in me and I in you. A branch cannot produce fruit alone, but must remain in the vine. In the same way, you cannot produce fruit alone, but must remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If any remain in me and I remain in them, they produce much fruit, but without me, they can do nothing. The abiding of the Christian in Christ refers to maintaining an unbroken relationship with him. We are to make our spiritual home in Christ. There is nothing between us and our Savior. No sin that's not put away. We should depend upon him for our very life as the branch is dependent upon the vine. Abiding in Christ means the Christian must take their permanent resident in Christ. Permanent resident in Christ. We cannot be flip flopping. We cannot be on the left side today and tomorrow on the right side. Too many of us, we, we live double lives. Today we are in Christ when things are going good. When things turn bad, we decide that God is not good to me, so I'm forgetting about him. Well, I'll tell you, God is an unchangeable God. God don't move where you move. You need to move where God moves. And so since God is a righteous God, you need to remain righteous. Since God is a good God, you need to remain good. It is okay for the mangoes and watermelons and grape fruits and other fruits to be seasonal. But Christ calls us to be steadfast in him. Some of us serves only, serve only when things are good. Some of us serve only when things are bad. And it's a fact. Personally, I have a weakness with when things are bad. When things are bad, I, I tend to go on my knees and I, I start blaming God. Well, I don't do what this other guy does. I don't go to places this guy goes to. I mean, I've given up so much for you. I could be in the dance hall. I could have more than one wife. I mean, look, look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm young, I'm handsome. Right, Auntie Joya? And so many of us 
we have that weakness. We, we, we think that God owes us something. And it's human nature. I mean, look at Job as, as, as Ella Perry in his sermon, lovely sermon last week, pointed out that so many people was like, hey, why don't you just curse God and, and, and give up the ghost? When things are going good, we, we some of us we praise him. We are happy that he is our savior. We will we will give our life for him. Because we still have that nice car and we still have that nice house. And we still have a lovely family. A sin lovely family, to put it that way. Some of us, when, when, when things are bad, it keeps us on our knees. It's the reality of life. Some of us, if God would bless us with a million bucks today, tomorrow, we're gone. And so, the Bible is saying that we as Christians, we, we need to abide in him through our good times. We need to stick with him in our bad times. We need to be steadfast Christians. In closing, as I don't want to keep you too long, in closing, I pray that we as believers will stay connected to that true vine. There is a big difference between relationship and fellowship. A big difference. Not everyone that is that church is here for the relationship. Church has become a social gathering. And so we come to fellowship. Some of us, there is the only place that we can give up some steam. We come, we sing, we shout, we raise our hands and we feel good. But during the week, what do we do? Do we carry that relationship throughout the week? Do we have a relationship with him throughout the week? It is easy to, to sit in front of that television set and, and, and just watch movies upon movies without end. It's easy. I do it sometimes. As one finish, you change to another channel and, and you look at another one. It's easy to be consumed with Facebook and all the social medias out there. But how much time do we spend in the world? How much time do we, do we spend on our knees? I mean, I understand that um, as we grow old and arthritis kicks in, that many of us cannot go on our knees. I understand that. But then we look at the younger generation, we look at the younger people, we, we, we look at, at, at people of my age and people who can kneel. They just don't choose to kneel anymore. We are, we are losing sight of, of the things that we, 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 we once knew and the things that, that meant something 
does not mean a thing anymore. And someone might say, big deal. I close my eyes, I bow my head. But kneeling in itself is a form of reverence. It says, Lord, I'm submitting to you. I'm beneath you. Many of us, I mean, at one time I, I used to, me and my wife, we would, we would just go to bed and lie down and say a prayer while lying down and fall asleep. But was it the right thing to do? We would sit and watch a television show. But when come to, 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 to pray, we figure out we'll, we can do it anyhow. If we want to lie down, we lie down. If we want to stand up, we stand up. And no reverence. I'm saying we need to abide. Abiding in Jesus means I've got to see Jesus in every circumstance. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1 21. The living Bible puts it this way. For to me Living means opportunities for Christ. And dying, well, that's better yet. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Abiding in Christ means Christ live his life through you. Will you promise to abide in him till he comes?